Sensation and perception researchers represent a broad range of specialties, including ophthalmology, the study of the eye's structure, function, and diseases, audiology, the science concerned with hearing, neurology, the scientific study of the nervous system, and many others. Understanding sensation and perception requires comprehending the physical properties of the objects of our perception, light, sound, the texture of material things, and so on. The psychological approach to these processes involves understanding the physical structures and functions of the sense organs, as well as the brain's conversion of the information from these organs into experience. We understand our world through our senses, our windows on the world. Our reality, in fact, is dependent on the two basic processes of sensation and perception. A simple way to remember this is sensation is gathering information. Perception is interpreting information. Our world is alive with stimuli, all the objects and events that surround us. Sensation and perception are the processes that allow us to detect and understand these various stimuli. Now, we don't actually experience these stimuli directly. Rather, our senses allow us to get information about aspects of our environment. And we then take that information and form a perception of the world. Sensation is the process of receiving stimulus energies from the external environment and transforming these energies into neural energy. Physical energy, such as light and sound, uh, is detected by specialized receptor cells in the sense organs, such as the eyes and the ears. When the receptor cells register a stimulus, the energy is converted into an electrochemical impulse or action potential that relays information about the stimulus through the nervous system to the brain. When it reaches the brain, the information travels to the appropriate area of the cerebral cortex. The brain gives meaning to sensation through perception. Perception is the process of organizing and interpreting sensory information so that it makes sense. Uh, receptor cells in our eyes record, that is, sense, uh, a silver object in the sky but they do not see a, a jet plane. So sensation is about the biological processing that occurs between our sensory systems and the environment, while perception is our experience of those processes in action. In this module, there are three sections, how the physical world relates to the psychological world, how we see and how we hear, and how we make sense of what we see. How do signals that make contact with our sense organs, like our eyes, ears, and tongue, become translated into information that our brains can interpret and act on? And how does the raw sensory information delivered to our brains become integrated with what we already know about the world, allowing us to recognize objects, avoid accidents, and find our way out the door each morning? Our brain picks and chooses among the types of sensory information it uses, often relying on expectations and prior experiences to fill in the gaps and simplify processing. The end result often differs from the sum of its parts, and sometimes it's a, a completely wrong number. Errors in perception, like the illusions we'll look at, are often informative, not to mention fun and they show us which parts of our sensory experiences are accurate and which parts our brains fill in for us. Perception does not offer an exact replica of the world outside. The brain subjectively constructs the world using innate and learned assumptions and principles. The tables on the next slide represent the brain's misinterpretation of perspective information. Are the tables really the same? Here's an example of a misperception. The two tabletops appear to have different dimensions and shapes. However, they are identical. To convince yourself, measure one and then compare it with the other. Even knowing this, you cannot make your brain see them as identical. As you can see, we can't always trust our eyes, or more accurately, our brains. 
Let's move on to the first section of this lecture, how the physical world relates to the psychological world. And this involves three questions, the detection question, the difference question, and the scaling question. And I've reproduced a table from the text which uh, summarizes uh, each of these uh, questions and the answers they address, which we are about to cover. We'll start with the detection question, which is concerned with the limits on our ability to detect very faint signals. How intense does a light wave have to be for us to see it? And how intense does a sound have to be for us to hear it? Psychologists study the phenomenon of the absolute threshold of a stimulus, the uh, lowest level of a stimulus that we can detect on 50% of the trials. Imagine that a researcher fits us with a pair of headphones and places us in a quiet room. And she asks repeatedly if we've heard one of the many very faint tones. Now, detection isn't an all or none state of affairs because human error increases as stimuli become weaker in magnitude. Another concept is subliminal stimulus. Now, even though we're subject to subliminal perception, that doesn't mean we numbly uh, succumb to subliminal persuasion, as advertisers would like to believe. A subliminal stimulus is one that is detected only up to 49% of the time, and the effects are short-lived with no long-term behavioral consequences. Now, some researchers do contend that subliminal persuasion is possible. Yet it's probably unlikely in most cases because we can't engage in much, if any, in-depth processing of the meaning of the subliminal stimuli. As a result, the stimuli probably can't produce large-scale or enduring changes in our attitudes, let alone our decisions. In this famous magazine advertisement for Gilby's Gin, some viewers claimed to spot the word sex in the three ice cubes in the glass on the right. Now, is this a subliminal advertisement? Well, the answer is no, because even if the uh, viewers were right, uh, they could see the word sex. Uh, but by definition, a subliminal uh, image is uh, one that uh, we can't consciously detect. Here are two graphs representing the theoretical and observed absolute thresholds. A is a depiction of the result that the psychophysical researchers thought they would observe in their signal detection studies. Theoretically, the absolute threshold is the minimum amount of physical energy in a stimulus necessary to detect it. If a stimulus does not have this much energy, it should never be detected. Now, if it has this much energy or more, it should always be detected. Now, B is a de depiction of the uh, result that the psychophysical researchers actually obtained. Now, there was no amount of physical energy in a stimulus that led to the kind of responding depicted in A. Instead, the responding looked more like a uh, flattened S shape. Thus, the absolute threshold was statistically defined as the minimum amount of energy in a stimulus detected 50% of the time. Why did the signal detection studies result in this flattened S? Well, sometimes the signal is so weak or so faint that we're in doubt and uh, simply guess. And individual people have different tendencies to make one type of guess over another when they're in doubt about whether a weak signal is present or absent. Now, psychologists developed a clever way to take into account some people's tendency to say yes when they're uncertain and other people's tendency to say no when they're unsure. Now, instead of always delivering a sound, researchers sometimes presented a sound and sometimes not at all. Now, this procedure allowed them to detect and account for a subject's response biases. As we can see in the table, subjects can report that they heard a sound when it was present. So this would be a true positive or a hit. Uh, they can deny hearing a sound when it was present, a false negative or a miss. Report hearing a sound that wasn't there, that would be a false positive or false alarm. Or deny hearing a sound that wasn't there. A, a true negative or a correct 
rejection. Now, the frequency of false negatives and false positives helps researchers to measure how biased subjects are to respond yes or no in general. In summary, signal detection theory assumes that the detection of faint sensory stimuli depends on a person's physiological sensitivity to a stimulus, in other words, how well their eyes or ears work, and on decision criteria for detection, which is based on non-sensory factors, such as motivation, attention, and even emotional state. Let's pivot from the uh, detection question to the difference question. The difference question is concerned with limits on our detection abilities, but in this case, with our ability to detect very small differences uh, between stimuli, such as what is the smallest difference in brightness between two lights that we can see? What is the smallest difference in loudness between two sounds that we can hear? Just how much of a difference in a stimulus makes a difference. The just noticeable difference, JND, is the smallest change in the intensity of a stimulus that we can detect 50% of the time. The JND is relevant to our ability to distinguish a stronger from a weaker stimulus, like a soft noise from a slightly louder noise. Uh, imagine we're playing a song on an iPod, but the volume is turned so low that we can't hear it. Now, if we nudge the volume dial up to the point at which we can just begin to make out the song, that's a JND. Now, Weber's law states that there's a constant proportional relationship between the JND and the original stimulus intensity. Uh, <laughs> in plain language, the stronger the stimulus, the bigger the change needed for a change in stimulus intensity to be noticeable. Now, imagine how much light we would need to add to a brightly lit kitchen to notice an increase in illumination compared to the amount of light we would need to add to a dark bedroom to notice a change in illumination. Now, we would need a lot of light in the first case and only a smidgen in the second. And finally, we'll look at the scaling question. The scaling question is concerned with how we perceive the magnitudes or intensities of clearly detectable stimuli. What is the relationship between the actual physical intensities of stimuli and our psychological perceptions of these intensities? People can actually uh, rate on a scale by providing a number, uh, the intensity they uh, uh, perceive uh, in, in terms of the uh, stimuli. For example, perhaps uh, the last time you uh, went to the doctor, you were in some pain, and uh, the doctor asked you to rate from 1 to 10 the intensity of that pain. Stevens' power law is a proposed relationship between the magnitude of a physical stimulus and the intensity or strength that people actually feel. Perceived magnitude of a stimulus is equal to its actual physical intensity raised to a constant power for each type of judgment or the particular stimulus involved. For instance, to perceive a light as twice as bright, its actual intensity has to be increased between eight and nine times. Likewise, if an electric shock is doubled in intensity, we perceive it as being about 10 times more intense. Sensory adaptation refers to the disappearance of repetitive or unchanging stimuli. Sensory adaptation happens when the body's sensory receptors are exposed to a particular stimuli, such as loud noise, high temperatures, or strong scents, for a long enough time that the re receptors decrease their sensitivity to the stimuli and make them less noticeable. This happens when a tobacco smoker stops noticing the smell on their clothes and hair, or when a hot bath feels cool after being in the water for just a few minutes. This same adaptation happens when wearing perfume or cologne. Within an hour of applying the fragrance, the wearer no longer smells the scent. Now, sensory adaptation actually has survival value, as it is more important to detect new stimuli that might uh, represent danger than constant stimuli. 
The detection, difference, and scaling questions are leading researchers to a better understanding of how the physical world relates to the psychological world. In this section of the lecture, we'll explore how we see and how we hear physical characteristics of light and sound waves. Our visual and auditory systems provide input about the world out there, but not until incoming information is processed by the brain. We'll explore the structure of the eye, which is a living optical instrument that creates an image on the light-sensitive retina. The lens creates an upside-down image on the retina, but this doesn't matter because the brain knows how to interpret this image. An auditory stimulus, the screech of tires or someone laughing, produces sensory input in the form of sound waves reaching the ears. We'll begin this uh, section by looking at the structure of the eye and then examine the structure of the ear with the understanding that transduction is necessary whereby the nervous system converts a physical stimulus such as light and sound waves into electrical signals within neurons. Now, of course, our eyes detect light waves and our ears detect sound waves. Wavelength is the distance in one cycle of a wave from one crest to the next. With respect to vision, humans can see wavelengths of about 400 to 700 nanometers. Amplitude is the amount of energy in a wave, its intensity, which is the height of the wave at its crest. For light waves, amplitude determines its brightness. Here we can see typical waveforms and their characteristics. A short wavelength is uh, a high frequency wave, which gives us a bluish colors and high pitched sounds. A long wavelength is a low frequency with reddish colors and low pitched sounds. Remember, wavelength is the distance of one complete cycle of the wave from one crest to the next. A wave's frequency refers to the number of times it can cycle in one second. The longer the wave, the lower the frequency. On the right, we see a great amplitude gives us bright colors and loud sounds, where a small amplitude wave gives us dull colors and soft sounds. The amplitude of the wave refers to the amount of energy in the wave, which is the height of the wave at its crest. Sound waves are vibrations of molecules, which means they must travel through uh, some physical medium, such as air. Sound waves are usually generated by vibrating objects, such as a guitar string, a loud speaker cone, or your vocal cords. However, they can also be generated by forcing air past a chamber, uh, such as in a flute, or by suddenly releasing a burst of air, as when you clap. Frequency involves the number of times a sound wave cycles in one second, with shorter wavelengths having higher frequencies. That determines the pitch of a sound, that is how high or low the sound is perceived to be. Now remember, our ears and eyes begin the process of transduction, that is the conversion of physical energy into neural signals that the brain can understand. Here's a diagram of the eye. First, light waves, the white arrows, are transduced by the rods and cones at the back of the retina, generating neural impulses about the visual image. The rods and cones then send the information about the visual image to the bipolar cells, which then pass it along to the ganglion cells, indicated by the dark arrows. The axons of the ganglion cells, bundled together, converge to form the optic nerve. The optic nerve carries the visual image information to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe of the brain via the thalamus. A couple of common uh, visual problems are caused by focusing problems in the lens. For nearsighted people, light rays from distant objects are focused in front of the retina. For farsighted people, Light rays from close objects are focused behind the retina. After being processed in the retina, patterns of neural impulses describing the visual image are carried through the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells, which bundle together to form the optic nerve. Now, where the optic nerve leaves the eye, there are no receptor cells, thus we have a blind spot. 
The optic nerve runs through the thalamus, which acts as a relay station to uh, transmit sensory information to the correct part of the cerebral cortex. Visual information is directed from there to the occipital lobe, where it is processed. Feature detectors recognize basic features of the stimulus, which are then coordinated to give it meaning. Uh, for example, that's when we perceive it. Cells in the visual cortex respond to very specific types of uh, stimuli. Some are sensitive to lines, some to uh, edges, and some only react to more complicated stimuli. The key point is that cells in the visual cortex seem to be highly specialized. They have been characterized as feature detectors, neurons that respond selectively to very specific features of more complex stimuli. After visual input is processed by the primary visual cortex, it is often routed to other cortical areas for additional processing. The retina contains uh, millions of receptor cells that are sensitive to light. Surprisingly, these receptors are located in the innermost layer of the retina. Hence, light must pass through several layers of cells before it gets to the receptors that actually detect it. The retina contains two types of receptors, rods and cones. Their names are based on their shapes, as rods are elongated and cones are stubblier. Rods outnumber cones by a huge margin. Humans have about 100 million rods, but only about 6 million cones. Now, rods are receptor cells in the retina that are principally responsible for dim light and achromatic vision, or black and white vision. Cones are receptor cells in the retina that are principally responsible for bright light and color vision. The special sensitivities of the cones allow us to uh, perceive color. However, cones do not respond well to dim light, which is why we don't see color very well in low illumination. Now, there are a couple of theories to explain how we see color. Trichromatic theory assumes that there are three types of cones, each only activated by wavelength ranges of light corresponding roughly to blue, green, and red. And it further assumes that all of the various colors that we can see are mixtures of various levels of activation of the three types of cones. And it suggests that if all three are equally activated, we see white. Another theory is the opponent process theory, which assumes that there are three opponent process cell systems, red, green, blue, yellow, and black, white, that process color information after it has been processed by the cones. It assumes colors in each system oppose one another in that if one color is stimulated, the other is inhibited. The theory can explain complementary color after images. When you stare at one of the two colors in an opponent process system for a while, the part of that system responsible for processing this color gets tired and has to stop and recover. And this is why we see the complementary color in the system when we look at a white surface. Uh, the other color is recovering and cannot oppose it. Now, a good example is provided in the text of the American red, white, and blue flag. If we stare at a picture of this flag for a while and then switch our attention to a white sheet of paper, we see a complementary green, black, and yellow flag. Composite theory contends that research supports both trichromatic theory and opponent process theory. And it suggests that the best explanation involves both theories, but at different locations in the visual pathways. Color information is processed by the cones according to trichromatic theory. But color information is also processed at the post-receptor cell level by bipolar, ganglion, thalamic, and cortical cells according to the opponent process theory. Now this provides a good example of competing theories becoming complementary theories. Let's move on to a brief look at how the ear works. Sound is conducted through the ear by way of air pressure changes. After entering through the pinna, the sound waves create vibrations in the eardrum that lead to movement of the three tiny bones in the middle ear, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. 
Now this movement leads to vibration of the oval window that leads to movement of the fluid in the inner ear, displacement along the uh, basilar membrane, and movement of the hair cells within the membrane. The movement of these hair cells creates the neural signals that are taken to the primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobes via the auditory nerve, which goes through the thalamus. The inner ear is a crucial part of the transduction process. The cochlea contains the basilar membrane lined by about 16,000 hair cells that are the receptor cells for hearing. Fluid in the cochlea is displaced, causing the hair cells to move, in turn causing the sensation of hearing. Uh, the hair cells, remember, are the receptor cells for hearing. Now, when these hair cells or auditory nerve fibers are damaged, a person suffers nerve deafness. Conduction deafness is hearing loss due to damage to the mechanical system, which is carrying sound waves to the cochlea. Pitch is the quality of a sound perceived as high or low, and is determined by the frequency of the sound wave. Humans can perceive sound wave frequencies from about 20 to 20,000 hertz. Now, several theories address how pitch is distinguished, and two of these are explained in the next slides. Frequency theory proposes that the frequency of a sound wave is mimicked by the firing rate of the hair cells across the entire basilar membrane. Now, groups of neurons were found to accurately encode their firing rate frequencies up to about 1,000 hertz. The Volley principle was proposed to deal with this. The Volley principle is based on a military procedure developed to deal with the problem of slow reload times in old firearms, such as the flintlock rifle. Assume some hypothetical firearm that takes 30 seconds to reload. Now, if everyone in the unit fired at the same time, there would be a 30-second lull between firing. If the soldiers were divided into, say, three ranks of 30 each, then each rank fired 10 seconds after the pre preceding rank, then the soldiers could, as a group, send a hail of bullets off toward the enemy every 10 seconds. The phases of volleying bullets could be changed. Now, in the same way, groups of auditory fibers could fire in volleys. This principle of volleying in different phases could extend the range of frequencies which could be potentially encoded by the principles of frequency theory, which explains our perception of sound up to about 5,000 hertz through the volley principle and the perceptions of lower pitch sounds. Uh, less than 500 hertz. Now, because 5,000 times per second is the upper limit for the firing rate using the volley principle, frequency theory would not be able to explain how we perceive higher frequencies. Consequently, place theory was developed to deal with this limitation in frequency theory. It suggests that there's a specific place along the basilar membrane in the inner ear that corresponds to a particular frequency and explains how we perceive higher frequencies above 5,000 hertz. High frequency sounds selectively vibrate the basilar membrane of the inner ear near the entrance, the oval window. Lower frequencies travel further along the membrane before causing any appreciable excitation of the membrane. The basic pitch determining mechanism is based on the location along the membrane where the hair cells are stimulated. The first thing we see after we wake up in the morning is typically unbiased by any previous image. Now, if we're on vacation and sleeping somewhere new, we may not recognize our surroundings for a moment or two. Building up an image involves our past experiences and many external elements, such as light, uh, biological systems in the eye and brain that uh, process images for us. The brain must make sense of what we see. In this last section of this lecture, we cover the concepts of bottom-up processing and top-down processing, perceptual organization and perceptual constancy, and depth perception. Bottom-up processing refers to the processing of incoming sensory information as it travels up from the sensory structures to the brain. Top-down processing, on the other hand, 
is, involves the brain's use of knowledge, of beliefs, and expectations to interpret sensory information. There are more top-down connections. Because top-down processing is so critical to perception, there are more top-down neural connections than bottom-up connections, about a 10 to 1 ratio. Perhaps the best example of top-down processing is reading text. Take a moment and read this phrase. And do you notice any errors? We often read right over typographical errors in text. Because this text gives us some contextual information, we know what words to expect and automatically and unconsciously miss words or letters. This demonstrates that we have expectancies about what words will appear and these expectancies override the actual stimulus to the eyes when we miss a typographical error. So a good proofreader must work hard to avoid expectancies from preventing bottom-up processing, perceiving the letters actually on the page rather than the expected letters or words. And they do so by avoiding reading for meaning. Please read this sentence and count the number of Fs. And if you want, you can stop this lecture and uh, carefully uh, review it. There are six Fs in this sentence. Most people see three. One theory is because the brain does not process the word of due to top-down processing. Don't worry, it took me several scans before I discovered the remaining Fs. My bias to read for content led me to miss those F's in the of's. Perception is subjective because of top-down processing. Perceptual set occurs when we interpret an ambiguous stimulus in accordance with our past experiences. Researchers have shown that perceptual sets can have a dramatic impact on day-to-day -day life. In one experiment, young children were found to enjoy french fries more when they were served in a McDonald's bag rather than just a plain white bag. In another study, people who were told that an image was of the famed Loch Ness Monster were more likely to see the mythical creature in the image, while others who later viewed the image saw only a curved tree trunk. A contextual effect occurs when we use the present context of sensory input to determine its meaning. Here's an example of an ambiguous image. Uh, some of you may see a mouse, while others may see a man uh, wearing glasses. And, uh, or you may switch back and forth. You can't really see both at the same time. It's hard to uh, keep both images in your mind at the same time. And here we can see the effect of context on perception. Across the top line, you can more clearly see the ambiguous image as a man wearing glasses. Across the bottom line, where we are in the context of animals, we more clearly see the image as that of a mouse. Our brains work hard to make sense of what we're seeing. Perceptual organization and constancy are essential processes for bringing order to the incoming sensory input. Sensory data must be organized into meaningful holes to be interpreted. The present context of sensory information must be used to determine the meaning, that is the contextual effect. With top-down processing, uh, much of our visual perception involves analyzing an image in the context of its surroundings and our expectations. Gestalt principles are rules governing how we perceive objects as wholes within their overall context. Gestalt principles of perception help to explain why we see much of our world as consisting of unified figures or forms, rather than confusing jumbles of lines and curves. Gestalt means organized whole. Gestalt psychologists believe that the organized whole is greater than the sum of its individual pieces of sensory information. The figure ground principle states that the brain organizes sensory input into a figure, or the center of attention, and a ground, which is the background. Closure is the tendency to complete incomplete figures to form meaningful objects. Subjective contours are lines or shapes that are perceived to be present, but don't really exist. Now here
here's a classic example of figure ground ambiguity. When you look at this image, do you see a white face or two blue facial silhouettes looking at each other? And you, you can see both, but only one at a time. Why? When you switch your perception from one to the other, your brain is switching how the input is organized with respect to figure and ground. When you see a vase, the vase is the object. But when you see the two faces, the vase becomes the background. Here's a classic example of organizational perceptual ambiguity. Do you see the head and shoulders of an old woman or a young woman? And uh, I've had difficulty with this one over the years, but eventually I can see both. But I can't really hold on to uh, one particular uh, perspective. Why, why does your perception keep switching? Well, if you're having trouble seeing the old woman, she has a large nose, which is uh, located below and to the left of the center of the figure. And the old woman's large nose is the chin and the jaw of the younger woman. Now, you can't see both of them at the same time. And this is because, uh, and you may not even be able to see both, but, but, but this is because there's no uh, contextual information to determine a correct uh, interpretation. Your perception will keep uh, switching from one interpretation to the other. This is an example of a subjective contour. Does there appear to be a very bright triangle overlying three black circles and another triangle? Well, I hate to break the news to you. This brighter appearing triangle isn't really there. It is a subjective contour created by your brain in its perception of the three black circles with a chunk missing, the three Pac-Man-like characters. Now, to demonstrate that this overlying brighter triangle is not truly there, we'll cover up everything in the display but the horizontal blank center. Now, when you do this, you will not see any difference in the level of brightness across the horizontal center of the display. If the wider triangle really were there, you would see differences in brightness. Now, when a person approaches you from a distance, his or her image on your retinas gradually changes in size. Do you perceive that person as growing right before your eyes? Well, of course not. Your perceptual system constantly makes allowances for this variation in visual input. In doing so, it relies in part on perceptual constancies. Perceptual constancy is a very adaptive aspect of visual perception. It brings order and consistency to our view of the world. It aids in brain adjustments of our perceptions in accordance with what we have learned about the uh, outside world. In general, perceptual constancies depth cues and the principles of visual organization, such as the uh, Gestalt principles, help people perceive the world accurately. Sometimes, however, perceptions are based on inappropriate assumptions and visual illusions can result. Adelson's checker shadow illusion is a good example, and it certainly appears that square B is brighter than square A. However, the two squares are the same shade of gray. Whereas there are other factors involved in this brightness illusion, an important one is that the two squares have different surrounding contexts. Square A appears darker because it is surrounded by lighter squares, and square B appears lighter because it is surrounded by darker squares. The message is perceived brightness is relative. On the right, the two squares are now surrounded by the same context allowing you to see that they are indeed the same shade of gray. We also experience illusions involving our depth perception. Depth perception involves judging the distance of objects from us. Binocular depth cues require the use of both eyes. And retinal disparity refers to the fact that as the disparity between the two retinal images decreases, the distance from us increases and vice versa. Monocular depth cues require only one eye. Linear perspective refers to the fact that as parallel lines recede away from us, they appear to converge. 
Interposition refers to the fact that if one object blocks our view of another, we perceive the blocking object as closer. Here's an example of an illusion of depth perception involving the linear perspective. The two red bars in the Ponzo illusion are identical in size. However, the top bar appears to be larger. Now to uh, convince yourself that the two bars are identical, just measure each of the bars. This illusion seems to be caused by the brain's misinterpretation of the relative distance from us of the two bars. Past experiences can also create some illusions. In the Mueller-Lyer illusion, the two vertical line segments in A and B are equal in length, but the one with the arrow feather endings appears to be longer. Thus, it is our past experience with corners, as we see in C and D, that leads the brain to believe that the line with the arrow feather endings is farther away. The moon illusion is fascinating, and it can be quite dramatic. The moon is the same size and remains the same distance from us, regardless of where it is in the sky. The moon on the uh, horizon appears much larger than it does when it is overhead, higher up in the sky, but this is just an illusion. Objects near the horizon lead the brain to think that the horizon moon is farther away than when it is overhead, so the brain mistakenly enlarges its size in our perception.